thank everyone for coming out. If you would, I'd like to open us up with a word of prayer, and then we're going to follow that with the Pledge of Allegiance. And the flag is right over here above the scoreboard. So if you would, just all stand. If you don't mind, we'll say a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this time, and thank you for this day and the opportunity to come before the citizens and just talk about the needs of the agency and the needs of the community and the things that we need to do, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for all the things that you bless us with. And we just pray, pray for your continued hedge of protection around the agency, the sheriff's office, the community. Lord, you know what needs to be done. So we just ask that we put it all in your hands and just watch over this meeting and guide us and direct us. These things we say in your name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> Again, thank you all for coming out. We appreciate you taking this time out of your schedules to come out here and hear about the sheriff's office and the things that we're progressing moving forward and, and want to show the transparency of what um, the sheriff is asking for in the budget and those types of things. I want to introduce uh, what we have up here on the staff, starting on my right here, is Director Chris Coldiron. He's over the Detention Department. Director Jim Morgan over the Operations Department, Sheriff Daryl Daniels, Director Ricky Wright over the Services Division and Department. Next we have Director David Barnes, and then we have Leslie Betts who's here from the Finance Department with us tonight. So again, um, what we're going to do here tonight, talking about the format, the sheriff is going to open up with some remarks and a presentation about the budget and the needs of the sheriff's office and where we're going moving forward. The directors will be available up here and they're going to um, add some things in it on the presentation and talk about each department. While they're speaking, if you have some comments or questions that you'd like to ask, the officers are roaming around and they have some uh, cards. You do not have to worry about the name or anything like that on the top of the card if you just want to put your question on there. If you want to fill out the top of the information, that's fine. We'll add you to our database to send out some resources and different things and keep you abreast on what's going on in the sheriff's office. But again, that's strictly up to you. Also, for the ones that can't make it tonight, everything is being streamed live on our Facebook account. So again, for those that couldn't make it, I know there's a lot of things going on in the schools with them just opening. So again, we would just want to make sure as many people as we can, we get the information out and you hear it directly from the sheriff's office. So again, um, as they're speaking, if something strikes you and you have a question, by all means, fill out that card, and we will make sure that we get it from you and do our best to get all the questions asked that we have. All right, so we appreciate that. Um, with that said, we're going to start with the opening remarks from Sheriff Daniels. And again, as he's speaking, if you hear something that you want a little bit more information or something that you just want to have some follow-up on, fill out your question in your card, and we'll make sure that we get to that. So with that said, Sheriff Daniels. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Is this clear enough? Yes? Um, I want to welcome everybody here to, to Central Point Baptist. I want to thank Pastor Lee back there in the background. Pastor Lee, thank you for hosting um, this town hall meeting. Really, the, the purpose of this town hall meeting was to have some in-depth discussion with members of the community and, and the elected officials and the media and everybody who has an interest in the upcoming budget or the proposed budget for the Sheriff's Office. And, you know, I didn't want it to be a contentious thing between me and the BCC or any other entity in the county, but, you know, it's kind of turning into that thing. Um, you know, some folks have, have said, you know, this is a historical ask to have a request of $10.2 million be added to the budget. Um, historical or not, there's a lot of things that have never happened in the county before that, ha that are happening. So the history making ask, you know, I, I'm asking for what we need. So with, when it comes to the BCC, I met with each individual, let, let me say four of five county commissioners. And the reason why I met four or five is when we extended the invitation to all five, one of the county commissioners chose not to meet. He said, I don't want to meet. But from the platform, he says, I didn't get an opportunity to meet with the sheriff. Well, that's fine because you didn't want to meet with the sheriff to discuss the budget. So, it, you know, it was kind of inferring that I wasn't available. 
Well, that's not the case. And, I'm, and it's not that I'm going to take shots at the BCC. I just want to clarify a few things that were uh, commented about from the floor of the county commission. One of the county commissioners said, well, I haven't had an opportunity to meet with the sheriff. Well, it's because he chose to set a date that was that Friday and their meeting was that Tuesday. So we had our meeting scheduled for that Friday. So of course he hadn't had an opportunity to meet with me because the meeting was that Friday versus that Tuesday. Well, the three others I met with and part of that conversation was, listen, we don't want to be a burden to the taxpayers. Make no mistakes about that. But I have an obligation to ask for the resources that I believe are necessary to, one, run the sheriff's office and keep the community safe. That's our duty. That's our obligation. How to fund that is not my responsibility. That's the responsibility of the county commissioners. So, you know, some of the county commissioners said you put us in an awkward position because the money's not available. I still have a duty to ask for the resources that we need. And that's what I did. But the conversation for each of them was this. However, we're flexible, and I'm certainly flexible because nothing in our budget is a mandate. For example, if I ask for 200 officers, 200 deputies, yeah, that would be unreasonable, but that's not etched in stone. If I ask for one deputy, that's not unreasonable, but it's not etched in stone. If I ask for no deputies, new deputies, it's not unreasonable, nor is it etched in stone. So anything that we ask for that is not some, based on some increase that we didn't have any control over, is something that we're flexible on. So the $10.2 million being asked for as an enhancement to our budget, it was something that was necessary. It still is necessary. However, we have had some follow-up meetings with the county manager who is essentially, if you don't understand the dynamics of, of, of the county, is the go-between between the constitutional and different county entities, leadership entities, and the county commissioners. So we've had a couple of follow-up conversations with the county commission, I mean with the uh, county manager, and I explained to him the flexibility of the sheriff's office. So we are now down I, like look we've trimmed as much as we can and are down to the range of 4.9 million dollars that we are asking for and the county manager says you know i was kind of thinking and i and, and by the way i'm not talking behind his back i told him that i would be sharing this with the folks in attendance because listen the sheriff's office doesn't belong to me the sheriff's office doesn't belong to anybody who wears a uniform and i remind these men and women of that all the time the sheriff's office belongs to the taxpayers of Clay County. Now, I am just one taxpayer, but there's more of you than there, than there is of me. And I wanna make sure that you are exposed to, one, the information and intent behind the request so that you can say, as the taxpayers, I want you to go continue going in that direction or I don't want you going in that direction at all. I think you need to do something else. Because listen, I work for y'all. And like I said on social media, I'll do whatever you want me to do. If, if you say go in flat, don't ask for anything, you know what, it's your money. I won't ask for a thing. And I'll let, I will let the BCC, and these guys are going, oh, don't say that. But it's the fact of the matter. It's your dollars. But if you think that these enhancements that we will articulate are things that are needed for the sheriff's office to move forward in a growing county, then let your voices be heard both tonight and in the BCC meetings. Because you are the constituents and taxpayers that drive the decision making or should drive the decision making of the elected officials. Long gone or long gone should be the days where leadership in a community that are elected officials just make decisions independent of the people who put them in office. I believe that when the people put you in office, you do what the people want you to do. If you don't do that, then they vote you out of office because you did, you did not adhere to their voice. So I want to make sure that you're equipped with the most current information to make real decisions about how your tax dollars are spent. I think that's fair. And once this budget is approved, whatever that budget looks like, I'm going, I plan to do something that has not been done in my time in law enforcement, to my knowledge, in any law enforcement agency, and that is this, <clears throat> to have quarterly updates on the budget from the sheriff to the community to let you know how your dollars are being spent and what we're spending them on to keep us honest and accountable for your taxpayer dollars. 
in law enforcement, the leadership typically is kind of tight-lipped and very territorial about dollars. Well, that should not be so. And I believe in transparency. I believe that we, as the stewards of your sheriff's office, should give you and keep you updated with the most current information. Now, we have whittled $10.2 million down to 4.9, like I said. One of the elements in that request was a step plan. A step plan for tenured employees in five-year milestones in tenure to get a certain percentage raise to their salaries. The reasoning and basis behind that is this, and this is something that I inherited and my predecessor inherited and his predecessor and so on and so forth, is employees are leaving the sheriff's office, they come to the sheriff's office because they want to work for the Clay County Sheriff's Office, and then at some point they realize I can get paid to do the same thing somewhere else for more money, and they leave. And it has nothing to do with loyalty, has everything to do with basic economics. The folks that are typically in law enforcement are at the age or in that age group that they are still interested in putting food on the table and more money in the coffers of their family so that they can have a good living. They're not retired folks who have worked their years. They're still in their formative working years, so they're trying to put food on the table. And I understand that. And can we ever pay the employees of the sheriff's office in this service-oriented profession what they're truly worth? No, we can't. If we paid them $100,000, all of them, everybody, $100,000 a year, actually, would that be enough? Some would say, yeah, that's more than enough. It's not enough when that person puts their life on the line and they die in the line of duty. Then $100,000 doesn't seem like a whole lot. And we start our deputies at $38,000 a year. $38,000 a year. That's what we're asking a man and a woman to put their lives on the line for. Would you put your life on the line for $38,000 a year? I, I don't even want feedback because I know the majority of you guys would say no. And it's not a matter of getting in this profession to get rich because when you're a first responder, whether it be a firefighter, rescue, law enforcement, military, you don't get into these service-oriented professions to get rich. You do it for love of country, love of community. You do it because you care about the, the, the environment. You care about the folks around you. You care about the neighborhoods. And you want to be a part of the solution and a part, not a part of the problem. One of the things that we most recently came up with as a group in the sheriff's office was this saying. And you may start hearing it more and more. We deliver safety one quality experience at a time. What are we in the business of doing? Delivering safety, one quality experience at a time. That's what we do. We try to keep the community safe. That's our job, to keep you safe. And you know what? That requires money. It requires equipment. It requires bodies, i.e. deputies, and not just deputies, folks in detention and civilians who are working behind the scenes for menial salaries to keep the machine running. And like the ladies in dispatch in the communication center, I mean, I'll just put it in layman's terms, they're working for peanuts. And there are other entities that are paying way more than the Clay County Sheriff's Office. And I get that, you know, but I also get this. Clay County is growing. Not growing at such an alarming rate that we're busting at the seams and we can't keep up with the growth of the community, but growing in a way that we as a sheriff's office have to project the growth and the amount of resources necessary to maintain safety and security and order in our county. And so that's what we've done. <clears throat> in conversations with the uh, county commissioners, you know, I have heard, you know, Clay County is the fastest growing county and say it tongue in cheek in, you know, like, r really, like, whatever. We, we may not be the fastest growing county in the state, but we are growing. 
and we can't keep the same numbers as we did 10 years ago for a county that's growing. We can't keep the same number of resources in place to fight crime when crime is encroaching on Clay County from every border that we have with the same resources. We just can't do it. And just like if you knew that your family was going to grow and you lived in a one bedroom home, you would make some adjustments. Either you're going to have a room addition or you're gonna to move to something larger. It's no different, it's that simple, it's that basic, it's nothing complex about it. And you know, I think that some folks, and here's the real, one of the real reasons for having my executives up here. Some people don't understand the budget building process. They think that, and this is laughable, they think that I sit in the office and toil over numbers, millions of dollars in resources and numbers, and I'd make little adjustments to figures for the next coming fiscal year. Well, that's not the case. I have department heads who are responsible for certain areas in the sheriff's office. In their level of responsibility, they determine what the needs are for their department. Once all those department heads come together and they bring these figures and, and this, this ask to my attention, then I look at it and, I'm, and I set priorities. And I cut back a lot of the things that they ask for. And they've heard me say it. It's not like this is Christmas time and the taxpayers are Santa Claus just pouring out dollars. And not to insult them, but they look for the best option to keep people safe. And I look for the most efficient option that is not going to be so burdensome as to the point where you're trying to kick the doors into the sheriff's office and drag me out and go, are you crazy? There's a fine balance to it. And I will speak more about these things, but I want to give these men and lady an opportunity to speak about some of the needs in their departments. And we'll start with Director Coldiron, who will be talking about detention, the Department of Detention, which is, i.e., the jail, and we'll go on from there. Director. Hello, can you hear me with that or just speak loud? Okay. Uh, I'm Director Coldiron. Uh, I'm in charge of uh, the Clay County Jail. Uh, I can tell you we have many challenges ahead of us with the Clay County Jail. You've seen us in the news here lately with uh, some incidents that have, that have happened. Um, but there are many legislative mandates that have changed some of our mandatory staffing requirements. Uh, there was the Dignity for Incarcerated Women's Act uh, that, that went into effect in July, uh, which changes some of, the, of our housing uh, responsibilities that we have within the jail. So that's gonna, that in itself is going to increase some of our staffing requirements that we have there. <coughs> Um, we actually wanted uh, four additional officers because we wanted to be able to uh, staff the hospital watch. We've had increased hospital watches with drug use and drug abuse in the county and arrest. So we're constantly having officers at the hospital and now we're paying them overtime. We want to be able to staff that and have that as a manned position. Uh, we have a camera system in the jail that was installed and antiquated the day it was installed. Um, we, as the sheriff's office, we want to be able to record the cameras that are inside our jail. We feel that's the best for accountability for the officers and for the inmates. Um, but with that, that comes a huge price tag. And even looking at the stepping into getting it to where it needs to be, took it three to four phases. You're talking about several hundred thousand dollars in each phase just to get it to where we're at the point where we can record. And it can be state-of-the-art uh, uh, facility. The jail is 21 years old. We have not added on to the jail. The administrative building is 21 years old, have not uh, added on to that, but our male, our jail population has reached its maximum already once this year. That's gonna continue. Uh, as far as the county grows, we're gonna continue having more arrests, unfortunately, but that's a part of what we do. Um, so we have to look at what is the, the next phase and what we're doing. And I'll back on our, our, our camera system to give you a little bit of perspective. You might have seen it on TV in one of the interviews we had. We can't even reprogram our system because it uses a floppy disk. No one uses a floppy disk anymore. So we are steadily, every, I'll have one camera that'll work one day, won't work tomorrow, four days later it'll actually come on. And the, the multiplexers that we use, if one actually breaks, we gotta look on eBay to see if there's one available so we can actually uh, pull our system back up. Um, we have, since it is 21 years old, the jail facility, uh, we have to look at retrofitting some of our facilities for ADA compliance. Uh, changing some of the what was standard equipment um, 
21 years ago is not standard equipment today when it comes to inmate safety and officer safety. Uh, we want to look at, at getting a, uh, a body scanner for contraband. Um, he will get contraband into detention facilities. Anything that we can do that can, can decrease uh, the availability and opportunity to do that, we need to do it. But they're expensive. They're not cheap. It's not like a little wand that you can do for a piece of metal. These are things that they scan the entire body. Um, there's a lot of things that we're looking at trying to update our current jail facility, but it's, it's the elephant in the room. It's going to have to happen. We can't, we can't put it off for 10, 15 years because we only have so many spaces. There's only so many uh, inmates that can go in there, and then a burden to the taxpayers even more when we have to pay another facility to house our inmates. And we should be able to do that in-house because we have a professional staff that can actually handle the job. We just need to have the opportunity to be able to do it right. <clears throat> Hi, um, I'm Jim Morgan. I am the Director of Operations. Uh, the Operations Department covers the Uniform Patrol Division, which is uh, the guys you see are driving around all day long. It also covers the Special Operations Division, which is the traffic unit, the, uh, currently the SROs, uh, the PSAs, uh, SWAT, dive, field force, uh, pretty much all the fun stuff. Um, it also covers the Investigations Division, uh, Major Crimes, uh, Burglary Unit, uh, special victims unit, uh, that type of stuff. Uh, before I kind of go into my needs, I just want to kind of explain the process of, of how we come up with our budget. And it's pretty much the same way with all, all of our departments here. Um, it, it's just, we just don't pull these numbers out of the air. Um, every year when we start to look at our budget process, the sheriff gives us his goals and objectives for the year. Um, he, he hands those to the directors. We go back with our staff. I have three chiefs and an assistant chief. We sit down, I sit down with the chiefs. These other department directors sit down with the chiefs. We lay these, these goals and objectives down to them. They go back and they look at what they have in their divisions and they decide and they determine what they have to have to meet those goals and objectives that the sheriff has. We all have specific long-term objectives and goals that we have to meet. Our main in the Department of Operations is, is to serve and protect. We have to respond to calls. We have to go help people when they call us. So we always have that one. We always have to maintain minimum staffing levels to go respond when we need to do that. So we always keep that one on our, as our number one priority. So we keep that, we take what the sheriff gives us, and we try to decide what is our minimum staffing levels, what's our minimum techno technological levels that we have to do, and we come back as a staff together and say, this is what our minimum needs are. At that point in time, these other departments do the same thing. Typically, the department directors get together, sit down and say, this is what my needs are. They say, this is what our needs are. And we try to come up with a plan to present to the sheriff. All right, we establish as the four directors and with uh, the finance department, these are what we think our party should be to present to the sheriff. We meet together with the sheriff as a staff and say, Here's what we believe our priorities are. And like you said, at that point, he decides what level we should be going at. So that's pretty much how we establish what we believe our priorities are and what our needs are. Sometimes it falls within what the county's revenue says we can do, and sometimes it doesn't. So that, and that's where we are this year with it. And Department of Operations, our two big needs right now are, and continually is going to be personnel, it's going to be technology. I mean, we are, we are going to be personnel-wise for long term we are short. We're going to continue to be short until we get properly um, staffed up, until we get the money to do that. Um, currently, this year, we asked for 25 positions in operations. That is roughly first year cost $3 million. All right, right now, we're at 4.9 is what we're at. That's more than half of what we're at right now that we're trimmed down to from original 10.2, I believe the original ask was. So as you can see, if I get what I need alone, that doesn't leave a whole lot for the rest of this group up here at this table. So personnel right now, technology, we've got a lot of stuff we want to get accomplished, and it, it just takes money to do that. So. I just want to make a few comments after the young lady. The Clay County Sheriff's Office is a 21st century law enforcement agency, and the fact that we have some pieces of equipment that run from floppy disks is laughable. And a couple of chuckles came from the audience, but this is your sheriff's office running on floppy disks. And it's my job to push us into the 21st century. Unapologetically, I want us to be the best sheriff's office in this country. I'm not gonna back off of that. 
Now, we may scale down the budget to be flexible, not as not to be a burden, but not to the point where it's to the detriment of the sheriff's office and the safety and security of Clay County. There are certain things that are just non-negotiable. And, you know, I alluded to a step plan, and I didn't close the gap on that. We are, we as a sheriff's office, are leaking people at what I call an alarming rate. And it's something that I inherited, and so did my predecessor. And the stopgap for that is to put measures in place to at least make the sheriff's office attractive enough to keep employees. They call that employee retention. And that's at every level. It's, it's the crossing guards. It's detention. It's the civilian employees. It's the deputies. It, across the board, there are agencies across this county, every single one of them starts out paying more than the Clay County Sheriff's Office. We are the largest law enforcement agency in this county, but we are the lowest paid agency in the county. Now, some may say, well, the Orange Park Police Department, they start off lower than you. Yeah, they do. But after one year in employment, their officers make more than the Clay County Sheriff's Office employees. So we are essentially the lowest paid law enforcement agency, although we do the lion's share of the work in the county. I just want to move us to the 21st century. You have heard of the proverbial Podunk County. This is not Podunk County. Clay County is far from Podunk. Wherever Podunk is, this is not it. And it never will be, not under my administration. We're not trying to take the sheriff's office backwards in time to a place where I first was introduced to Clay County back in 1983 when I first hit the ground here. This was a, it was a different Clay County. It was quieter. Those were good times. And some folks have fond memories of 1983 and those years past. It was 2019 now. And some of our partners around us, i.e., and I'll call them out, Duval County, St. John's County, Bradford County, Putnam County, their crime encroaches on Clay County, and as does ours and theirs. It's, it's give and take. But we have got to address the borders of Clay County and keeping technology or putting technology in place that the director alluded to that helps us to fight crime. And that's what, that's what we're committed to do. And with that, Director Wright. Good evening, my name is Ricky Wright and I am the director of our services department. So let me explain what that really means. We're the folks who do all the behind the scenes work. Um, things like our IT department, crime analysis, communications, and I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Um, our crime scene technicians, the folks who process crime scenes, who come to your residence and they're dusting for prints, those folks work in the service department. Our civil processing, building maintenance, probably is something you never think about. Um, our buildings need maintenance, and we have a whole unit for that. Um, records department, and then our fleet and radio. So let me talk briefly about the IT department. As you know, think about social media, think about the phones you're holding in your hand tonight. All those things are things that are growing and our agency has to continue to grow and keep up with that change. And we have to increase the individuals who, who work in that unit in order to keep up with the change. Technology is a huge, huge part of law enforcement the old time of just simply walking the beat and chasing the guy that just doesn't work they're smarter than we are we don't keep up with that change director um, Morgan spoke about some technology as it relates to basically watching using cameras to watch people commit crimes that technology is increasing and changing and we need to be a part of that probably one of the part one of the one of the units that we have that really we struggle with is our communication the sheriff spoke about that. Now they're technically called telecommunicators. We all know them as dispatchers. The reality is when you call, you need someone to answer that phone. We're losing them at an alarming rate because they're going someplace else to work. We're not paying them enough. Those folks really work hard. Those folks are not only concerned about 
the state there are deputies, but they're concerned about you calling. We have to find a way to fix that. We need to increase their pay, but we also need to get them on board. So here's a pitch for recruiting. You have someone who wants to be a dispatcher, send them our way. It's a lot of work and it's hard work. The other thing that probably stands out is our fleet. You know, we, we constantly seems like we're changing um, and buying cars. Absolutely we are. When you call, you want us to get there. You don't want us on the side of the road because our, car ha our cars have 150 plus thousand miles and they break down. We have to keep our fleet strong. We have to be smart about how we buy vehicles. We have to pay attention to um, the type of vehicle we pay, excuse me, that we buy because what happened in our last storm is a prime example. With the cars we have, some of those cars went through water and it shut that car down. If that car was a little higher, if it was a truck or an SUV, then we can get through that water so we can get help to those folks who are asking for help. I want to leave you with this. At this table, not including the sheriff, you've probably got about 95 years of experience. Well, that experience is what helps us try our very best, and we don't always get it right. None of us are perfect. Try our very best to give the, 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 the sheriff the numbers he needs to present the budget. And that experience is going to help better serve you. Good evening. My name is David Barnes. I'm the Director of Personnel and Professional Standards. What that is is obviously personnel, HR, training, professional standards, which is our accreditation unit, and then also our professional oversight, which involves our Internal Affairs Division. Uh, as you've heard these gentlemen talk about, one of our top priorities in my department is providing the staff that these other departments need. Uh, our top priority is the selection and training as well as the retention of those qualified individuals that are come to your house when you make that call. One of our obstacles is, is hiring and retaining those people when those folks around us are paying more. You've heard the sheriff and, and Director Wright talk about the communication section leaving. Uh, just in 2017, we had 62 employees resign, 81 in 2018 and 56 in 2019. Now, every time one of those employees resigns and goes somewhere where there's more money, we have to start over. We have to start that vicious cycle over again. And I'll give an example. It takes 946 hours to train a deputy sheriff just the basic level to get him, where he can op him or her can operate on their own. It takes 856 hours to train a detention deputy where they can function on their own. And then the communication folks that we're talking about, it takes 787 hours to train that individual so they can function on their own. So every time we lose one, we start that cycle over again. That's why we need a step plan. We have to start putting things in, in place so that our employees stay and we retain those quality individuals and then we can use advanced training techniques and things of that nature to make them better. And as the sheriff said, we can deliver safety one quality experience at a time. Uh, that's pretty much all I got. Good evening, I'm Leslie Betts. I'm the finance manager at the sheriff's office and our goal in finance is basically, I always tell the people that work with me, we would not have a job if we weren't out there to support the uh, men and women out there in uniform. So some of our initiatives we try to do is we manage all of the financial reporting and the grants that are out there and we're constantly actively pursuing um, and trying to leverage all the funding opportunities that are available as, as grants or task force initiatives that we can be reimbursed for for the agency. And it, currently today we have six grant applications out there trying to um, augment our annual budget. Some of the other initiatives we have is um, we have our continuous improvement um, projects and we also have strategic planning. And one of our big goals is we take great pride in the fact that we want this year to be again our 15th year of a comment free audit. And some of the things I hear people, I've heard just in the community a little bit, you know, talk about the, the cost of running the agency and the cost of living and that sort of thing. Well, typically as a taxpayer and as a citizen, our cost of living goes up each year and we get a little bit of a raise. Well, so does the cost of doing business at the Clay County Sheriff's Office. And our operating and support of our mission to reduce crime, reduce the fear of crime, and improve quality of life in the community for the citizens of Clay County takes money. So we try to actively really um, strategically plan the budget 
maneuver the budget for the needs and as the needs change for each department in the agency we try to move the budget where it needs to go and where those initiatives that the sheriff has where we can fund those particular initiatives my turn <laughs> um you know and i'm on un i'm unscripted i just like to speak to the people and i know that in this conversation a lot of people may have questions and i know it's kind of cumbersome to be in a format where you're writing a question down on a card and some people really just rather yell it out from the floor but we want to do things decently and in order so that um, you know, people get an opportunity to ask their question. And albeit, this town hall meeting was narrowly and specifically put together to, to have discussions about the budget, you know, our media partners in the back, and, and Lord knows I never want to villainize them, they have a job to do, and their job is to push information. And we, as the sheriff's office, don't take that personally. And they don't either. It's just like we have a job to do, they have a job to do. Um, you know, so they are invited to ask questions. And I'll be speaking to them briefly, briefly offline, you know, once we conclude this, to, to answer whatever questions they may have um, for, their, for their various outlets. You know, one of the guys, Jeff, he says, I'll throw you out of there. Jeff says, this, he was told in his office this is the first time the sheriff has made an appearance in public in the past few months. I'm out every day. And, you know, we're, we're certainly not hiding from anybody. You know, and like I told Jeff, I have a job to do. And that job is to run the Clay County Sheriff's Office and meet the constituency of this county and be mindful of what their voice has to say. And you know, in terms of hiding and all that stuff, you know, we're not doing that. Just like no members of the sheriff's office do that, neither do I. Certain things have transpired, I'll, I'll just go ahead and address some of the, the elephant in the room. Certain things have transpired in the media and uh, have caused FDLE, the Federal Department, the, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, to be conducting an investigation on me and my actions. And that is still underway. I, I kind of would have thought that it would have been done by now. And that's kind of a hint, hint for if they're listening. But, you know, they're, they're looking into matters to see whether or not, I, I think, to see whether or not the sheriff of Clay County violated any laws. I can tell you that I didn't, but they have to conclude that. And a lot of people have made decisions and made comments and formulated opinions based on a lopsided narrative but it's only the only information that they were provided with because I didn't have a whole lot of conversation about personal matters and I, and I still don't. But I will say this, since I have the, the uh, cameras looking at me and I'm on Facebook Live and, and I got a wife at home, you know, I've never made a public apology to that woman. And I just want to apologize before y'all. You know how they say, I'm going to say it in front of God and everybody. I want to make sure that everyone understands that Denise Daniels, I love that woman. And I apologize to her publicly. And these guys are like, sure, you know, stop. No, that's my wife. And I apologize to her. So I want to make sure I give you all some good sound bites on that. That's, that's, not, even, that's not even something said for, for feedback or applause. It's the right thing to do because I do love the woman. I've known that woman since I was 17 years old. 17 years old. And we've been together that long. And for her to put up with me, regardless of what that putting up looks like, that's a lot for any person. And I wanted to make sure, she doesn't know I'm saying this, to make sure that I publicly apologize to her. There's two entities that need apologizing to. See, there's a lot of false victims out there. Sheriff owes us an apology. Well, I don't sleep next to you at, at night. I sleep next to Denise, so I owe her an apology. And then there's somebody in heaven that can forgive sins. That's a, I owe him, owed him an apology. So me and God are good. Me and Denise are good. As far as my job as the sheriff, I hope not to let you down and that you and I stay good. But as long as I wear these stars on my shoulder and wear this uniform, I'm going to do everything in my powers as a man and as the sheriff to keep Clay County safe. 
And like I said, I'm not going to apologize for that. Now, there may be some folks that are critics in the audience, and there may be some folks that we love our sheriff no matter what. I'm here to serve the critics, and I'm here to serve the supporters equally to keep you and your family safe. And I hate to sound cliche, it sounds so cool to me, we deliver safety one quality experience at a time. That, that sounds really good to me. And that captures the essence of why we do what we do. So we'll segue into, it says follow-up questions, but I'm sure it meant follow-up questions. And we will take the questions that Assistant Chief Smith has and if it's appropriate for me to respond to the question, I'll respond to it. I may weigh in as a side note, but we'll push it to the appropriate director if necessary. So, Chief. All right, we'll get started, Sheriff. The first one here I have, <clears throat> excuse me, will a beefed up code enforcement department aid in crime reduction? And then the second part here says, will money from developers, the large ones, tax incentives hurt your budget? I, you know, a beef, that's a good, I, w I wish somebody would give me the nod and get, so, so I see who's thinking like that. Be a, beefed, <laughs> a beefed up code enforcement, I think we only have one or two code enforcement folks here in Clay County. Two. Well, I'm told one and a half. There are a lot of code enforcement violations in Clay County. This has been a conversation that uh, we have had internally, even for me to ask what would it take to empower the deputies to be code enforcement certified, if you will, because there's more of us than them, and we are eyes and ears all over this county. It would help us in Clay County to enforce. It certainly would improve the aesthetics of Clay County. Um, you know, everybody can go in any particular neighborhood and see that neighbor who's got something going on that you go, is anybody even seeing this? And we just recently did a walk in one of the neighborhoods and I'm having a conversation with a guy in front of his house and his grass, if that was grass, was about at least five feet tall. And he says, I know I don't have room to, to be talking about my neighbors when my yard looks like this. The only thing I can think of was a bush hog to come mow his grass because that's what it would take to do that. Um, I think that it would help. The big businesses, wouldn't, that wouldn't hurt our budget. Um, it would help Clay County, actually. The, the more folks who bring their businesses to Clay County, move to Clay County, work in Clay County, play and do everything else in Clay County other than commit crimes, helps Clay County. We'll continue to be good stewards of your tax dollars. And I want to say that publicly. Um, there were some comments from the BCC about the sheriff is going to go to the governor and he's going to, you know, force our hand on making us give him $10.2 million. Well, I never said that. In fact, I don't know where that came from, although I do have that as an option. This is Clay County, and this is what I tell the commissioners. This is Clay County. I think that we, as the leaders in Clay County, can come to some kind of middle ground and consensus that works for this county without, you know, inviting Tallahassee or any other outside entity, if you will, to help us manage Clay County. We're, we're fine all by ourselves. So I, I hope that that answer, did I answer your question? Kind of, sort of? Basically, I was talking about the large... Lord, I don't open it up though, from the floor. Go ahead. The large developers that are coming in here, the county's offering them, I'm assuming, some huge tax incentives to come in and foster that growth. Well, that takes away from money that could be allocated and used by the Sheriff's Department is basically where I was trying to go. Yes, back. sir. I understand. So for those who didn't hear, um, the gentleman from the floor was saying that you know, the, the commission is attracting big business to come here with, with certain incentives that could take away from dollars that could be allocated towards the sheriff's office budget. Listen, we're just one part of this big machine to keep Clay County safe and to run. And there are other county entities out there other than the sheriff's office. And far be it from me to put the sheriff's office and this county in a position where we're asking for every single tax dollar out there to the detriment of every other county entity. So, you know, we got to tighten up our belts as well, but make no mistakes about it. We're not in a recession. There is money flowing through this county. I'm not asking for all of it. I just want what we need to keep the sheriff's office 
in a position to keep you safe as we grow this county. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So some, there are people who are wanting to know what was said out in the audience. And some of the commentary for the, from the young lady had to do with code enforcement or the lack thereof. And she mentioned that the county, the new county manager came out to their neighborhood to look at some of the things that were going on in that neighborhood. And, uh, you know, this was new to him. So we will have a conversation offline to, one, find out where exactly you live so that we can, we as the sheriff's office can do all we can to uh, be good stewards to assist you as taxpayers to uh to that end yes, all right ma'am. sheriff the next question is from one of our viewers on facebook live they know director cold iron talked about the needs in detention what about a new jail are we going to eventually need one here in clay county I, and i am going to defer to because he can speak well on that and so can i but it's his department the answer to that is yes we have a 478 bed facility and we have gone over that capacity at least once this year. And you know, over the summer times, you get influxes of, of, or, or large arrest numbers because sometimes folks just don't have anything better to do but commit crimes. I wish they would do it somewhere else. But as the population grows, as the population grows, you can expect a certain percentage of society to go to jail, unfortunately. And this is, you know, Clay County is no different than any other jurisdiction. This is not a utopia, though it feels like it to me. Um, we enjoy a good quality of life here. And the Sheriff's Office is committing to keep y'all safe. But at some point, we are gonna outgrow our current setup in the jail, and it's gonna require us to either add on to that facility, and I don't think we can, I don't think we have the capacity to go up, or we have to build another facility. And that's going to be increased dollars to do that, millions, tens of millions of dollars, and also more resources, i.e. staffing, to staff it up. So an even more enhanced uh, enhancement to our, to our budget. So yeah, we're going to get there. But I'll allow Director Cole down to uh, give some feedback. Uh, if I can add a little bit to this, I think there's some uh, misnomers about the jail population. A lot of people have, have said in different media outlets, uh, why don't you stop arresting people for misdemeanor amounts of marijuana? Well, those aren't ones who stay in the county jail for very long. 80% of our jail population is felony offenders. So if you look, when you look at the 80% of our population, the 20% is the misdemeanors. It's the misdemeanors that, that are person's crimes that you don't want out there every single day because they have violated their probation. They violated their injunctions for, for protection. They've committed domestic battery. Uh, uh, driving under the influence of alcohol. Those are the misdemeanors that are actually in our jail. So when you look at, at what our jail population, it's not like we can just not arrest people or just let everybody go. We can't do that. And then when you actually look at what our sentence population, because there was discussion one time of having a pea farm over off the property that we got off 215. Currently, our, our sentence inmate uh, population is not anything that could support that. And once you actually do that, you have to outfit that entire location with another kitchen, another uh, laundry facilities. Then you got to look at transport, uh, transporting those inmates from one location to another. Ideally, I've expressed to the sheriff, my, my, uh, my dreams would be to build a new admin building somewhere else and expand our jail at the current location that it's at. That's safety for the inmates getting transported to court. We already have a tunnel that's there. Um, there is some space that we can expand there, but we have to get serious about discussing what are we going to do next because next thing you know we're going to be out of space with no other option but yes we, we don't just fill the jail up with a bunch of misdemeanor offenders people that are in there deserve to be in there and until they see their day in court and the judge says they can go or they're going to go to prison or become one of our our uh, inmates for a, a sentence period of time we're going to take care of them 
but it, it is to the point where we got to look at what's next. Thank you, Director. Thank you. All right, Sheriff, if I'm reading this correctly, with the expansion of Clay County, are we going to have enough deputies to cover the new growth that is coming to cover the territory? I know you kind of touched on that briefly, but. Well, it's a good question. And you've heard me say, if you listen, you know, for, for any period of time here recently, we talk about a state average of having 1.74 deputies per thousand people, citizens. That number in 2019, right now, puts us at 47, uh, you passing me the numbers, I'm not gonna go through all that, puts us at 47 deputies shy. Is it doom and gloom? No, we're not trying to paint a picture of Clay County is growing at such an alarming rate that the Sheriff's Office can't keep up with the growth of the county and, and somehow Clay County is gonna be unsafe. No, we're gonna ask for the resources that we need. We're gonna be flexible with the BCC to try to meet those needs and we will come together as partners. One thing that I can say is the BCC will approve a budget. I can say for a fact it's not gonna be $10.2 million heavy like I've said to them, I get that. But I did need to let them know what we actually need. But we're gonna work with them. We will push it down the road as far as we need to push it to be good tax to stewards of taxpayers' dollars. Um, do we have enough coverage? We never have enough coverage. We are switching our, our uh, patrol hours to a 12-hour configuration. That's coming in the very near future. And the hopes is that we saturate the county in a way over a 24-hour period that there are no real gaps in coverage because there's, there's ebbs and flow in demand for service in law enforcement. In the wee hours of the night, and there's, there's different schools of thoughts here. In the wee hours of the nights, there's not a big demand for calls for service. So the calls for service dip down. As people wake up, they realize they may have been victims of crime. Sometimes people get up in their little honor and they start fussing in their house, households. They call, they call law enforcement, those calls for service spike up and they settle down a little bit and then they spike back up again in the evening. A school of thought is this. During those quiet hours, we can really be getting some proactive law enforcement done in a way that influences the resultant spike in the morning so that there is no spike in the morning. I believe in proactive law enforcement. This idea of being a reactionary law enforcement agency is antiquated. And yeah, that's what we grew up on. Anybody here is over 50 years old, we grew up on reactionary law enforcement, being reactive. You wake up, you realize you've been a victim of a crime, you call law enforcement, they come out, they write a report, they're gone, they try to investigate and capture the person. But you can do things as a law enforcement agency or put measures in place that are more proactive so you're actually out there looking. And I challenge the folks out in patrol and I give them the proverbial rah-rah speech. I'll just crash their briefings and say, listen, if you see somebody out there walking around at two o'clock in the morning, who's walking around at two o'clock in the morning? Nobody goes for a jog at one or two o'clock in the morning. And if they are, guess what? I don't think they'd be offended if we make contact with them and go, hey, you know, just look a little suspicious. Who are you? What are you doing? And find out what, what they're doing out there because they may be running to commit a crime or running from committing a crime. A clue is, a group of young men walking around and looked like teenagers, two or three of them, with backpacks on and dark clothing about two or three in the morning, yeah, they're not going camping. They're probably committing a crime, and some say, well, that's profiling. That's bias-based profiling. No, that's, that's criminal profiling. Most criminals who commit crimes, they have to put the fruits of their crime in something. Typically, it's backpacks. Typically, people don't commit crimes by themselves, but some people do. And, you know, we know this because of the interactions that we have had over the years, the experiences that we've had in law enforcement dictate a certain level of profiling, not racial pro profiling or bias based profiling. But to look at folks who are out in hours where crime is being committed and address that, if I can, if I can put my resources in place to make contact with somebody who's out there before they commit a crime, then when you wake up in the morning, no crime's been committed because we've addressed it at night by making contact with them. And on the streets is what they say. Oh, it's too hot out there. It's hot. Now, I'm not talking about the temperature. Hot as in there's too much law enforcement out there. Let me go back home or let me go somewhere else. 
the message has not changed in Clay County with our tolerance for criminal misconduct. You've heard me talk about three big gulfs, and it sounds cute and all that stuff, and, but the fact of the matter is the community, the community is sick and tired of folks committing crime. It's not just Clay County. That's just the, just so happens to be the jurisdiction that we have stewardship over. But the other sheriffs, they're fed up with it as well. And we have conversations, me and our outside stakeholders, on how we can better serve Northeast Florida. But we're fed up with it. But a lot of my messaging has been towards the criminal element. You know, but there are good, the majority of the folks in Clay County and, and in these different jurisdictions are good people. And so I'm rethinking my message, although it's to the criminals hasn't changed, but I wanna make sure that we're doing all we can for the good people of Clay County and to make sure that your voice is heard, to make sure that we're doing what you want us to do. That's what, that's what I want to happen. Will the coverage be there? As, it currently, as it's currently set up, even if we don't get up to the state average, there's ebbs and flows, and there's, there's areas where we're short. There are times in a 24-hour period where staffing is short. That's why we're, we're going to the 12-hour shift, so that we can saturate this county with more people. But we still have a finite number of people. We still need more people. No matter, no matter how you shape it, even if we enhance our technology, if we change our strategies, become more proactive, more so than we are now, we still need people. There's only so many ways you can skin a thing without people. I hope that answers the question. We'll keep you safe. All right, Sheriff, we're going to move on. I'm going to read this question as it's stated because I think there's a lot of misconception about this. Clay County now has four new police forces. With the creation of the school board force, now having jurisdiction in the entire county, can we justify the request for the extra officers in our budget? <laughs> and the audience laughed. But there are some, and not because it wasn't funny, it, or was or was not funny, there, are, there is a little bit of confusion about the capabilities and latitude of the school board police department. They don't have jurisdiction in the county. They don't have free reign of the county. They're not, a, they're not a supplement or an enhancement to the Clay County Sheriff's Office. No more than Orange Park Police Department or Green Cove Springs Police Department is to the county. They have their jurisdictions. Now what I have done is entered into uh, an agreement with the school board police department that if they on view, if they see a violent crime, they are police officers by the way, if they see a violent crime I've given them permission in the county, 1,000 feet from the school property, to intervene in that. So you're walking down the street, somebody tries to rob you. A school board police department police officer sees that, well, he or she needs to be taking action. They're sworn to protect and serve, too. They're just in it to protect our children. However, they're sworn law enforcement officers regardless. And it goes against the very fiber of law enforcement to stand by and watch a crime happen and watch somebody get victimized. And in the absence of a, a, a memorandum of, other, of understanding or MOU, that's essentially what they would be doing. And they wouldn't like it. I wouldn't like to see a crime being committed and me have my hands tied where I just watch it happen and I'm just a witness. No, I want to do something about it. So that's the response there. The school board police department has jurisdiction on school board property, wherever that property is, and that's more than just schools. They have administrative buildings. Um, there are calls for service that go out at schools that now the sheriff's office will not have to respond to. However, you know, you've heard that they'll need us before we need them. They will need the sheriff's office help before the sheriff's office needs their help. And I don't say that in a flippant way, but understand this, they, they are dealing with a small group of police officers to keep the students safe on a certain number of school properties. They're spread thin as it is, so you know, not to give divulge strategy, I'll say this, if something happens at a school, it's not like the entire police department force is going to abandon their school and go run over to that other school. They have to stay in place because that's what the law says. They got to be there to protect those kids. That's why they were put in place. That's why the district hired them. 
So they have to stay at the school in the event of an emergency. Now, any excess personnel, you're talking about lieutenants, um, the police chief, and maybe some supervisors, they have the latitude to move. But before they mobilize, there will be a conversation with the sheriff's office, and guess who will come essentially and save the day or be partners with them as we all save the day? And that's the Clay County Sheriff's Office. It's not like that. It's not like we're the hero and they're not the hero. The police officers of the school board police department can be heroes if the necessity for a hero arises in their jurisdiction. If they don't need help, they'll handle it. If they do need help, we'll come to the rescue. If we need help, we have help. So they don't have the latitude to, to run all over the county. To answer that question, there is still a need for additional staffing. However, some would say, all right, there are currently school resource officers at the school. They are employees of the Clay County Sheriff's Office. That's a fact. At the end of next month, those school resource officers will not be at schools. They'll be brought back into the patrol element or community affairs element. They'll be brought back into Director Morgan's operation. And so, you know, people think we're getting 19 employees and those employees can now be factored into the operations element. But we will be doing that. Those numbers were the numbers of people that were dedicated to school resource officer functions were in our, our original number, our original tally, when we said we were 47 short. That, didn't, that did not exclude them. They were included in the current staffing levels. You with me? They're part of the 275. Yes. So the question was, they're part of the current 275, 275. Yes. We will be reallocating their functions, and we'll see how that affects the, the operation. Because listen, it's simple logic, and I know folks are going out saying this out there, because I would be saying it too. Wait a minute, if you had 19 people, or X amount of people, and they were in schools and not performing a patrol function, and you're going to absorb them into a patrol function, you just got ex additional staffing to do a certain thing. We want to see how that plays out. So the question from the floor was the 25 deputies that Director Morgan spoke about when he was talking, were those all deputies or not? And the, and the answer, yes. Those are new hires, not students. Those, <clears throat> correct, those, are new, those would be new hires. Those were the 25 we requested with the original $10.2 million request. You still are standing by that you do need that? Correct. Okay. Thank you. And so I hope this, this piece helps to reduce from $10.2 million, and what that looked like, it's, it's more than just deputies. It's equipment, and it's other people, detention deputies and civilians. We are now at $4.9 million, still requesting those civilian assets, but we're down to five deputies, five. Five from 25. And the conversation with, and I want to make sure I, I'm conveying this. Somebody's not, I'm not articulating this right. All right, I'm going to start over. So the original ask of the BCC was to add $10.2 million to the sheriff's office budget. In negotiations with the county manager, and it's still going back and forth, by the way. Nothing, nothing's etched in, etched in stone. Um, we're, we're, we, the sheriff's office, is at about $4.9 million. 4.9 added to our budget. What that looks like in terms of deputies is we're now asking, instead of 25 deputies, we are asking for five deputies. So we're essentially spreading it out over the course of years. Now, so the county manager and, and a couple of the county commissioners in private conversations have said, well, can you push it out? Can you push your ask out for several years? I said, we push it out to 2030. 2030 is 10 years, that's a decade. So we, we pushed it out for a decade. So we'll push that out even further, but understand, and that's why I wanna convey this stuff to, to y'all as taxpayers, just so you know what's going on. Not to, not to say that there's some kind of going back and forth with the county commissioners. Guess what? We all want the same thing. Y'all want the same thing, we do, and the commissioners do as well. We wanna keep Clay County safe. 
it's just that there's a, a finite amount of money that go around. And so, you know, don't want to put them in an awkward position where they're robbing Peter to pay Paul, essentially. You've done your part. And you're probably saying, whatever y'all do. Some of y'all are saying, whatever you do, for God's sake, don't raise taxes. That's not my job to do. The taxation authority falls on the shoulders of two entities in the county, the BCC and school board. That's it. Not the sheriff's office. We just ask for what we need, and it's their job to fund it, but we don't want to put them in a bad position so that we hurt y'all. That's why I want to hear from y'all. If you say, Sheriff, five deputies is good, 4.9 is good, or see if you can peel a little bit more off of there as not be a burden, but guess what? Let your voice be heard. Even you out there on Facebook Live, if you say, Sheriff, whittle it down more. If Now would be the time to say that. Whittle it down more, we'll whittle it down more. The county manager said, you know, I'm thinking more like $2 million. Well, I'm thinking that the step plan is $1.29 million. That's without adding one person. Then there's the FRS, Florida Retirement System, increase. That's going up. And there's insurance is going up. Liability insurance is going up. Certain things just go up. Well, that's $2 million plus already. We have not got one body out the deal yet. So there's certain, and you say, well, can you scrap the step plan? No, I cannot. That's a non-negotiable. We will, I will fight for the benefits of these employees or get somebody else to do this job. It's my job to advocate for the employees of the sheriff's office. And by God, that's what I'm gonna do. I don't have to get a raise. I don't need a raise. But the men and women who are out there fighting crime or, or performing these supportive roles as civilians, they need to be paid more. And it's my job to advocate for them. When I became the sheriff, I asked the question, who, who goes to the BCC and asks for raises and, and, and fights for the benefits of, of the employees? They say, you do. I laugh because I, got no pro I have no problems doing that. And, I, and I'm going to continue to do that. And I think it's right to do that. I think that Clay County deserves well-paid employees. Yeah, we're not asking to drive Ferraris or anything like that, but we don't need to be pushing Pintos either. And that is what it is. We don't, we're not looking for the, uh, the, the high-end sheriff's office big dollar salaries. Well, Clay County was only 200 plus thousand of us. And of those, how many of those are taxpayers? So there you have it. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Next question, Sheriff. How much of the budget is allotted for PSA positions, which for those in the audience that don't know what that is, that's our public service aides that we kind of tease them. You see in the highlighter uniforms out there, so they're very visible. And what is it that they actually do? I'm going to let Director Morgan chime in on that, but I can say this. With the, with the scaling back down to 4.9, the number of PSAs that we're going to ask for that we had, we had asked for a certain number. Now we're asking for none because the only way you can cut back on dollars is to cut back on individuals' salaries and benefits. So we're not asking for any PSAs, but the director can speak to the PSAs. We scaled that back to eliminate all those PSA positions. Um, last year, uh, they handled the ones we currently have. We have 13 allocated positions right now. They handled almost, currently this year, almost 3,000 calls for service. Um, they take off all the um, traffic crashes uh, from patrol. Um, they work all, um, gosh, they do all kinds of stuff. Uh, traffic crashes, uh, nonviolent, tra or excuse me, non-injury crashes, non-criminal crashes. Um, our hope is to build that unit up to where they can start working some of the um, smaller crimes uh, where law enforcement officers not needed on the scene, um, auto burglary type stuff, theft cases where there's suspects aren't on scene. It's just basically write and report, minor processing stuff, that type of deal. Um, but because of the way we had to trim back the budget to, to uh, try to fall within the revenue stream that the county has, we're eliminating those positions and trying to keep as many deputy sheriff positions in the budget as we can right now. So. We have called for roughly 16 new positions. I'm sorry, I'm going off the top of my head. Total, including the 25 deputies under the $10.2 million. What now under the $4.9 million are we looking at in terms of additional personnel? Total department, well, I don't know. Uh, I don't have that. That, that. that number is out there. Um, it's, it's, so five deputies, the majority of the, t is 25. 
25 total. That's not deputies. Five of those would be deputies. So the question is, with, with the scaling back from $10.2 million to $4.9 million, what does that look like in terms of how many new employees are we looking to, to bring onto the sheriff's office? 25 new employees, five of which are deputies. The rest are civilians. We, we just have to, we have to have them. Four detention deputies. And of those, four are deten detention deputies. PSC, PSAs are valuable assets. They are force multipliers, and they can handle the things that uh, a lot of deputies could waste their time dealing with, but there are other important matters out there that need law enforcement attention that doesn't require a deputy to be at the scene of something else. So we use them and are looking for, for other ways to enhance their duties so that we don't have to have as many deputies. If they're force multipliers and we can use them in other capacities that mitigate our need for additional staffing, that's what we're going to do, you know, as not to ask for 61 new employees or 47 new deputies. We'll do whatever we can to be good stewards, and, that, and that's our commitment. That's the thing. You know, sometimes, you know, we get a, we get a bad rap in, in local government and say, you know, you ask, you ask, you ask, you know, what are you doing? And that's why I want to make sure that we're being very transparent, both now and after the budget is, budget is approved, because you are basically investing in local government. You need to know what your return on investment or your ROI is. What are you doing with my money? And if you somehow say um, it should be going in this direction, I, I mean, I want to know that. I really do. And, and you really do have a voice. Chief? Yes, sir. Thank you, Sheriff. All right, the current budget, Sheriff, has a cushion for overtime and possibly hurricane monies built into it. Will there be any funds left over, and will those go back to the county if anything's left? Anytime, there's no cushion. We don't we don't build in a we don't build in a cushion in the budget. Um, I could say so much because I want to take a shot at another entity, but I won't. We don't build cushions in. Over there is an overtime budget. The overtime budget is based on historical overtime usage, and so we build a budget based on that. If we know the direction that we're going in, there's certain things are, that are we can absolutely put our hands on. We know that Christmas is coming, and we know that during the holiday season, people look to victimize folks. So we step up our enforcement to keep people safe during those, during those, time, during those time periods. And we have what we call holiday overtime, holiday initiatives, and that requires overtime. Those are finite. And we don't just let the plane dry, you know, fly itself. We say, here's the amount of money that's dedicated for that initiative. We're not going to go over that. So those little things are things that we can put our hands on. There are summer initiatives that require overtime. You know what? We like to think that little Johnny and little Jane are the best little things and they're little angels. They may have been born little angels, but some of them little jokers can get into trouble, as we all did when we were coming up. Not that we're out there committing crimes, but, or they're out there committing crimes, but they can sometimes get in trouble. So to prevent that, we have summertime initiatives to keep them occupied, if you will. Um, but then there are other things like criminal investigations that go on. Invariably, somebody's going to get robbed in Clay County. And it's not going to be an 8 to 5, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. situation. It's going to be in, in the middle of the night, and somebody's going to be home asleep, and they're going to get a phone call, and they're going to get up, and they're going to put their clothes on and leave their family off hours. As we have to pay them. People just can't work for free. And I know as simply simple as I'm making that sound, that's the reality of where overtime is generated. We don't just go, I'm at the end of my tour of duty. I think I'm going to stay on for another hour or two and make me some overtime. It doesn't work like that. We have supervisors in place that go, somebody go, somebody on duty go relieve this guy so that he can go home to his family and not generate overtime. That's why we have overlap in, in other shifts in place. So 
the idea of giving money back, let me speak to that. When you prepare a budget properly, just like you prepare a household budget, you don't prepare a budget to, unless you're preparing to save dollars, and in local government, that's not what you do. You prepare a budget to meet the needs, the operating needs of your, whatever your operation is. If it's your family, you, you prepare a budget to deal with family issues. For law enforcement, we prepare a budget to keep people safe. We don't prepare a budget to give money back. We prepare a budget to spend that money because that's what we need. When you see a lot of dollars going back, that means that somebody didn't know how to prepare a budget well. That's what that means. Prepare a budget like it's supposed to be prepared, there's not a whole lot of money that goes back because you spend it all, because you needed it all. Doesn't mean that at the end of the year, you go, hey, anybody got any projects, special projects that you want to spend money on? We got a lot of money left over, let's spend this money. You know, no, 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 that would not be being a good steward of taxpayers' dollars either. That means something in the preparation piece was not as accurate as we thought it was. Now, you know what? If we, make a, if we set a budget for gas, gasoline, and gas prices just dip down to 99 cents a gallon, guess what? There's gonna be some, some fluff there. Or if gas prices go up to $5 a gallon, then we, might, we don't have to rob Peter to pay Paul because we didn't, we're not budgeted for $5 a gallon. We, we make the budget based on historical expenses and spending and projections of how we think we're gonna spend dollars. It's not a whole lot of fluff. And as far as hurricane dollars goes, you know, one of, the, one of the luxuries that I have is the number two person at the state emergency management piece was a guy who used to work for me. And he called today and he says, hey, if we get a hurricane, anything you need from the state, you got it. If there's money that you guys need, you got it. I'm like, all right, I wish I, I, wish I could go on record and say that because I just did. Kevin Guthrie's his name. <laughs> Sorry, Kevin. So you, you're out there now. And you Google Kevin Guthrie and you'll see what his job is. Chief? All right. For one of our viewers watching at home from the citizens, Director Wright, you mentioned earlier about the facilities. How are the conditions overall of the buildings? Are they going to need to be upgraded or rebuilt? And if so, does the money come out of our budget or will the county cover some of that? Overall, our our buildings are in fairly decent shape. So the county provides the budget for repairing our buildings. And it is, that, that budget is provided to the sheriff's office and it is our responsibility to identify those areas that um, need repairing and properly repair those, those areas through conversation with the county. Um, we're constantly looking um, for, for ways to I would say maybe rent space. You know, Director Codine talked about the jail, but we're, we will be in need of a, a, an administration building at some point. It's, it's just an old building, and you can put as much tape and, and paint on the wall as you can, but eventually things will start falling apart. We're, we're, not, we're not living in a, in a roof that has holes in it. We're, we're parent, we're, we are repairing those things, um, but we do have to keep an eye on it. Yes, sir. Okay. And while you have the mic, Director Wright, talking about dispatchers, how many dispatching positions do we have to be completely filled? And then how many do we currently have staffing? So we are down eight positions. So right now we are um, trying to think of the exact number. So we're probably close to the 30 plus number that we have in dispatch, but we're at eight vacancies and we have four in training. Now, just a few weeks ago, we had six in training. Two decided this wasn't for them. We'll, we will probably hire another six. We may keep two. It is stressful. It's a lot of work. But we just got to keep plugging away at that. All right. Thank you, Director. This next question here, it says, how many times have you been called to the schools already this year? And I can answer that, Sheriff, if you don't. Go for it. Um, with me being currently still over the um, juvenile crime section that we currently have at the Sheriff's Office, obviously we, already, we still have the current officers in the junior and senior high schools. 
We've had four incidents already that we've had to take care of with those SROs that are currently staffed at those schools. And then we've had two incidents that we actually had to respond to the elementary schools that we had to assist the school board police with. So again, um, like the sheriff mentioned already, that's still kind of, um, you have two law enforcement agencies having to coincide and work together, which we don't mind doing. But again, I hope that answers the question. And I'm sure in the future as we go, there's gonna be certain entities or certain incidents that come up. And like the sheriff said, if the 911 call comes in, no matter what, we as the Clay County Sheriff's Office, we have jurisdiction of the county and of that school and the guys in green are gonna respond and we'll do whatever we need to do and take care of business. And then if it's something that after we decide what has been that incident or what that piece looks like, if it's something that we need to transfer over to the school board police department, then obviously we will do that with MOUs in place. But we are currently still having to work and respond to incidents at the school. And I'm sure that number will continue to grow as we go through the year. So hopefully that answered their question. Real quick. Just, just real quick, can you hold that thought? There's another entity embedded in that, that child safety piece at the schools, and that's the guardians. Let's not forget that the, the guardians exist in that security element in schools. And we just recently certified a ton of guardians, and there are guardians that were already certified. And these men and women are civilians who go through some very intensive training to uh, intervene in the event of an active shooter scenario or some scenario where our children or administrators or teachers are put in a position where they're going to lose their lives. So these men and women are in those schools in addition to the police department and in addition to the sheriff's office current setup. Um, so we can't lose sight of the fact that there are guardians out there. Um, maybe an uns unsung hero one day, but we as a county overall holistically are doing all we can to make sure that not only are we keeping the citizens safe those kids are citizens as well so we're doing all we can to keep our kids safe those guardians are employees of the school district and they are paid Yes, ma'am, and I can actually get you the exact number in the calls and the... They did, but um, like Sheriff and Director Morgan mentioned earlier, we have a current contract in place until September 27th of this year. And so to honor that contract, you currently have SROs from the Clay County Sheriff's Office, as well as the SROs from the School Board Police Department basically doing the same duties. Yes, ma'am. And out of respect for the people who couldn't hear that line of questioning out there, the, the question from the floor was about the safety or security elements or who has jurisdiction in the schools. And right now you have Clay County Sheriff's Office deputies in there performing functions as school resource officers in the high schools and junior high schools until the end of September of this year. The police department has jurisdiction in the schools right now, and they are, they are, they are currently a stood up police department, and there are school guardians in there as well. All right, Sheriff, on the law enforcement calls per citizen comparison charts, with the tax money that those citizens are paying, does that include citizens that are served and protected by Orange Park PD and the Green Coast, Green Coast Springs Police Department? The short answer is no. Um, the, the person who's asking that question is referencing, referencing a chart that the people here can't see. But there was a presentation that was done at a BCC workshop, and we can make that presentation, I think the presentation is available on our website, Clay County Sheriff's Office website. So if you, if you go access it there and you look at that particular chart that's being referenced, that question is, does that take into account Orange Park PD and Green Coast Springs PD? No, that's strictly the Clay County Sheriff's Office. All right, thank you, Sheriff. And yes, the problem with taking calls from the floor is people can't hear the question, one. And two, it, it just 
disrupt the order of, or the flow of, of, of the meeting. Not, to, not that you don't have a voice. Come on, <laughs> ask it. Fair question. It exclusive of. The, the money. Yes, it excludes them. Not ex it does not hence the disruption in the, the continuity of the of the question and the answer. It does not exclude the quality of services provided from the Clay County Sheriff's Office towards the people in the county. It just, can, it just excludes their contribution towards the overall product. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? You tell me if it didn't. <laughs> Yes, sir. With the general concern across the nation about mass shootings, are our deputies adequate, adequately trained to protect the schools and the citizens in public spaces, specifically trained to respond to these incidences and take action? And I know we spoke about it, but they want to hear it again. Yes. <laughs> I say that. And, and I'm trying to get, squeeze as much as we can into a short period of time, but with respect to that question, not only are they adequately trained, and there are other entities out in the county that are adequately trained, but I personally went and spoke to the different assets out there, and I, and I asked them person by person, in the event that there was an active shooter in Clay County, and you have to respond alone, to deal with that situation are you committed to take care of business and we all know what that business is because i don't want a coward in the in the group protecting and serving because they'll wind up being a victim and i want to weed out anybody who's got some reservations about going out there and taking care of business on behalf of the taxpayers and their families to keep them safe in the event of of some person thinking it appropriate to to start shooting or doing something in Clay County that's going to cause mass, cause mass casualties. And, you know, as a group, the folks were shaking their head in the affirmative and saying, some saying, yeah, and some saying, absolutely, and some expletives, you expletive right, you feel, you fill in the blank, but I wanted more than just a collective response. I wanted individual responses where I'm looking somebody in their eyes because in the event that something like that happened, I want to have asked that person, are you going to respond? And they say yes, because if they don't, then I'll say, you told me that you were going to respond in that situation. It's one thing to broadly see a situation arising and go, I would do this or do that. But unless you've heard gunfire in person without ear protection on and it's rapidly firing and bullets are flying your way if you're not been in a situation like that you don't know what you'll do and we don't even train in an environment where we're shooting and you're hearing that whizzing bullets make a very distinct sound when they pass you and 
there's a lot that goes on physiologically in the human body when that kind of stuff happens. You don't know what you'll do, but we press through with training and hope and hope that our employees will rely on training and not the physiological responses that we know will happen in their body, like auditory exclusion and some of the other tunnel vision things that go on in the human body when faced with that kind of fight or flight scenario. We don't want them to flight or run. We want them to fight, fight to protect you. I, I didn't know we reduced. So the question from the floor was we reduced the number of squat officers. That was as a question. Yeah, that was news to me. Um, we are short on our SWAT team, and I know that the director's probably chomping at the bit to make a comment there, but uh, I think that we're going to have some SWAT tryouts here in the very near future. One thing about, I, you know, the, the men who are currently set up on as, as SWAT elements, they are they are the proverbial wild dogs that are being kept on a chain. And when somebody has to be bit, they get let go and they take care of business. It's a certain, it takes a certain individual to do that job. Everybody doesn't want to do that job. But those individuals who want to do that job, we have them doing that job. The only SWAT person that was moved into another job, there was two, two individuals that I know of and that, that was it. Those were Katalovich, he's a lieutenant, and Sergeant Marks. Katalovich, not to get into too much detail, she, so she wants to know who these individuals were who were moved from the SWAT team. A lieutenant runs the SWAT team. We have one SWAT commander. And to have another lieutenant or several lieutenants on the SWAT team as operators is it's a waste it's because those lieutenants are mid-management in the hierarchy of the sheriff's office and would have to leave their primary job as a mid-manager and then go function as an element on the SWAT team. That's not the efficient use, the most efficient use of personnel and we want efficiency. The other, the sergeant, I'll say it like this, Sometimes specialized units require special people. And this is my philosophy. Specialized units require special people. And when people are no longer special, they get removed from those specialized units. And that's all I'll say about that. Well, thank you, Sheriff. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna be wrapping up here shortly. We got one more question that I wanna follow up with. Several of you submitted questions pertaining specifically to your neighborhood about a traffic light, a traffic control, the speed limit, golf carts, those kind of things. Deputy Mulvaney, if you'll raise your hand, and Deputy Santiago, those of you that ask the specific questions about your neighborhood and traffic and those kind of things, if you will, at our conclusion, make contact with the two of them, their deputies in our community affairs unit, and they will be more than happy to get you the information because a lot of times you're asking a, a, gene, a generic or general question, but there may be something like a little entity to your neighborhood that's specific. Maybe golf carts are allowed in your neighborhood, but they're not allowed in another neighborhood. So I don't wanna tell the wrong question or the wrong answer or anything like that. So if you ask that kind of question, please get with one of them and they will get your information, get you the answer tonight more than likely, I'm sure. But either way, I don't want you to feel like you're leaving here not getting information or your question answered. So again, make sure you get with one of them and they will be more than happy to get you that information. With that said, Sheriff, we had one question here that we talked about the, sher uh, the Sheriff's Office responding to the schools and the school board police having to be there as well. So she's asking, help clarify, when a sheriff responds to a school incident and the school board also responds, how do we all work out the compensation to each officer or unit and are we wasting taxpayer monies? The sheriff responds? <laughs> if I respond, I mean, I get paid. I, I'm, the sheriff's I'm, office. Okay. I think there's a, red, I think I heard it from the floor, redundancy in place. I wasn't in favor of the school board police department. Let's, let's, and I'm not setting the record straight. I think I've said that time and time again, but the school board police department is in place now. 
and we have to support them as best we can. Now, some may say, ah, we can't, we can't let them fail because the, their failure is exposed, would expose teachers, administration, administrators, and children to the criminal element, and we don't want that. We, we just don't want that. And we'll be there if, if there's some duplicity in response. The sheriff's office pays for sheriff's office employees. The police department play, pays for police department employees. And what we don't want to happen is to have several agencies in one place just twiddling their thumbs, wasting time, burning taxpayers' dollars. Because either way, it's taxpayers' dollars, whether it's on the school side or the county side, it's still your dollars. I'm of the mindset that if, if a sheriff's office employee is needed at the scene, they'll be at the scene. If they're not needed at the scene, then it's my supervisors and mid managers responsibility to expedite getting those people what we call back in service so that they're available to take calls for service that are you know typically coming in from the phones um, you know I can't speak for the school board police department but as far as the efficiencies of the sheriff's office if we're, if we're needed at the schools we're coming as soon as we're not needed we're leaving and going back into the county where we belong what I don't want to happen tonight is I don't want somebody to go you know what, the way that this question and answers was formatted by God did not get my question answered. I wanted to ask this question and they didn't, ask, they didn't ask it or they didn't answer it. So if you fall into that category and it doesn't involve golf carts and trash cans and things like that, I wanna make sure that the chief here gets your question and we can answer it before we wrap up. Is there anybody out there like that? Come on, fire it off from, from the floor. The question was, how many license plate readers are in the budget? Currently, we have, we have one mobile. I think we have one fixed. And that's current, the current configuration. Um, we have uh, a C3 project that we've asked for this upcoming budget. I think we're somewhere in the area of $100,000. To trick it all out, to use lack of better terms, it's going to cost one point five million dollars to trick the whole program out that's where there are fixed camera locations all around the perimeter of clay county so that there is a geo fence if you will of technology so that if somebody comes into this county um with a stolen vehicle stolen tag or something like that or, or fits the description of of a suspect that is being looked for somewhere else that we get alerted and and it just creates an environment where there's a quick apprehension of those individuals. Because what we get is people coming in from other counties in stolen vehicles, they'll commit their crime here and then they go back to where they came from. Well, we're not the only one, Clay County is not the only ones embarking in this direction. St. Johns County is already there and they're enhancing their capabilities. Jacksonville Sheriff's Office is moving in that direction and enhancing their capabilities. My fear is if we don't step up and keep up with technology and keep up with staffing, the criminal displacement is going to fall in the laps of Clay County. What I'm saying is law enforcement of criminal misconduct is like slapping water that's on a table. All you do is move it from point A to point B. And if, if the entities around us step up their enforcement and their use of technology, crime goes to the path of least resistance. I don't want Clay County to be that path of least resistance because it's going to, it will be a volatile confrontation of epic, epic proportions if you're a criminal and you're watching. It's a warning and a promise, a promise to the good citizens of Clay County that we won't tolerate crime in Clay County, a warning to the criminal element. You try us, and we will hand you your rear end in Clay County. What that looks like is largely predicated on what you bring to the table. I know I said I would calm down my rhetoric, but it is what it is. If somebody wants to fight it out, we'll fight it out. If they want to run it out, we'll run it out. And if they want to shoot it out, I hope they've made peace with their maker because we will not tolerate certain things in Clay County. Y'all say, man, why are you saying that? Because I'm the person who's the spokesperson and the CEO of the Sheriff's Office. It's my job to do that and set the tone of the Sheriff's Office. 
And by God, if you're a taxpayer in this county, you deserve a sheriff who has the backbone to stand up for something that's right. And that is what, <laughs> that is what it is. Somebody's got to stand up for it. Somebody's got to stand up for our families. And these men and women who wear those uniforms, they feel the same way that I do. For the good citizens of Clay County and Northeast Florida, we'll work hard for you. We'll do whatever we need to do to make that budget balance for the county. And I'll, and I'll stand by my word and not be a burden to the taxpayers. And whatever that looks like, we'll work with it. When the BCC approves the budget, and, and I know they'll be, they'll be listening, and they'll go, whew, that's a relief. When the BCC approves the budget, whatever that budget is, we'll work with what we get. We'll just work with what we get. It is what it is. We, we're obligated to perform a, perform a certain function. And that's what we'll do. We need $10.2 million. We've whittled it, whittled it down to 4.9. We'll see where it goes from there. But I wanted to make sure that you had a voice. And from the floor, and from Facebook Live, y'all are the floor. Are we going in the right direction? Are we, am I doing something that you don't want me to do? Are we asking for resources that you don't think we need? If you think we don't need them, tell, tell me. And I'm, I'm being honest and transparent. As the sheriff, if you think we're moving in the wrong direction, let me know. Do not let me and these folks hang out there going in the wrong direction. And you go, this jack leg is misspending our money. But if you think that we're going in the right direction, you know, let us know. And if we are, let your voices be heard at the BCC meeting next Tuesday, I think it is. Not to be a headache for them or a thorn in their side, but just to let your voices be heard. They're, they are knowledgeable and wise people who are elected to do what you want them to do. But if you don't, know, if you don't let them know, they're going to do what they think is the best for the county, absent your input. Same here, but I want to make sure that I ask you first. Anyone else? Uh, you, you, so the question was, is the sheriff's office budget on any of the BCC agendas as a discussion item? I, I'm not really sure, but I know that um, they, the commissioners, are anxiously waiting on us to resubmit a budget. I, can't, I cannot resubmit a budget with unsurety. In other words, if we do a back, a back room handshake, and agree to, well, let's just say, we agree to $4.9 million increased to this budget or enhancement to the budget. And then when it's time to vote on that, they go, you know, we're going to cut the sheriff's office budget by $1 million. Not only is that not a, an agreement that we agreed on, that's encroaching in the wrong direction. I, I want some assurance, some reassurances before I resubmit a budget that's less than $10.2 million. question was, can I just submit what I submit? And if they turn it down, I, it, it'd be a moot point. It's your taxpayers' dollars. Let your voices be heard. Send them emails, phone calls. You know, you don't have to overwhelm them with stuff like that, but let them know what you want them to do. Yes, ma'am. So the question, the question from the floor, fair question was, um, is there ever a time in the future that the sheriff's office and, and these other law enforcement entities will come together and look for ways to mitigate inefficient spending of taxpayers' dollars? We do that, we do that already. Um, I have an opinion that I'll keep to myself on inefficiencies. I'm responsible for the sheriff's office. The other entities are responsible for their piece of the pie. I would only be a man speaking, you know, when it comes to 
my influence on their budgets. I can only influence the sheriff's office budget. You, the media, the me, not the, the media and the people can influence or should be able to influence the direction that some of these independent entities go in because again, it's your taxpayers' dollars being spent. No, I inherited it. Um, so the question, the question was, do I think that the retention or lack thereof in the sheriff's office has anything to do with me personally or my personal issues? The answer is no. My predecessor had this issue. Uh, his predecessor did. In fact, I have a, um, a little newsletter, an old newsletter, and I think it's back from like 19, the 1980s. Dalton Bray was the sheriff, and you know he's saying a few things in this newsletter, and he's talking about the need for more people, and you know just talking about some of the current state of of the sheriff's office. It's a problem that's been existing for a long, long time. There, there will never be enough law enforcement in place. We'll always there will always be somebody paying more. There will always be somebody who's looking to put food on the table and they go to another agency. You know, there are generational differences. And I hate to get into all of that, but I'm over 50 years old. I may not be as old as these, as these guys. <laughs> that was a shout over the bow. We're all close to the same age range, most of us. And when we got into this profession, we got in this profession to make it a career and retire from law enforcement, to stay committed and stay the course all the way through to our retirement age. The younger folks, not to bash them, they're a little more nomadic, they will travel. And if something good comes along, I'm not saying that they're disloyal, it's just that they're young and they wanna put food on the table and if somebody's paying 15, $20,000 more, you almost can't blame them. You just can't blame them. And you say, well, where's the loyalty in that? Where's the loyalty in being a father or a mother of a family and you have the ability to get fifteen dollars or $20,000 more and you say, I'm just going to stay the course, but baby need a new pair of shoes. That's the reality in the world that we live in. So, One last question, you Sheriff. You it sure? came in several times. How often is an audit done at the Clay County Sheriff's Office? <laughs> Go for it, Miss Leslie. She's Last, been chomping at the bit to get a question. Last but not least. Well, our audits are done annually as directed by the Florida State Statutes. We also have audits we conduct internally in different areas as well. So we have really good checks and balances in place as internal controls to protect your tax dollars. What, what we haven't been doing in law enforcement, and this is across the board, and I challenge other sheriffs, sheriffs to correct me on this. What we haven't been doing in law enforcement, and I'm just as guilty, you go, no, you can't be. Yeah, just as guilty is not being transparent with the budget and going, this is how we're spending your money and give you basically progress reports on how we're spending your money. I'm committed to doing that. And once this budget is approved, whatever that budget looks like, well, we will be showing you how your money's being spent and how we're trending. If we're trending up in overtime, I'll explain that we're trending up in overtime and here's the reason why. And if we're saving money, I'll let you know we're saving money. Just to give you updates because it's fair and it's the right thing to do. That's my commitment. Thank you, Sheriff. Was there anything else that you'd like to add? We're gonna Me? wrap it up at this time. <laughs> you got two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Has everybody gotten their question answered? I was serious about that. Yes, ma'am. We we are still together. Well, let me let me say this. Let, let me let me let me say this. So the question from the floor had everything has everything to do with my current marital status. Let me see how I frame my response. My pool guy 
is not of any interest to you. The man that repaired the roof from the last storm on my house is not of any importance to you. TDA Landscaping, my guy who does the lawn, is not of any interest to you. It's really my business. And what happens between my wife and I should not be of any importance to you. And if it is, you are overly invested in a Daniels household and you need to focus your attention probably on your own household where it rightfully belongs because the Daniels family doesn't care what your family does unless you bring it to our attention. And, and look, I didn't, make my, I didn't make our business your business, the media did. But I'll say this, we are, we are happily in our, since 1983, do the math, years of marriage, three, over three decades, encroaching on four, longer than a lot of people, I'd say, and um, not to get in a pissing match with the, the young lady up front, the Daniels family business is still that. Daniels family business, no matter how many ways you ask the question, it just is what it is. And that's all I'm going to say about that, Blondie. All right, what we're going to do now is if you have any other questions, I know some of the media may have some questions about the budget. And so if you do, by all means, just get with me. Um, Andrew Ford is up here, the public information officer, and Laura's up here. So again, thank you all, all for coming. We appreciate you taking the time to come out and be with us. Again, if there's a question pertaining to <laughs> something in your neighborhood, whatever that may be, there's members of the sheriff's office here, traffic, um, like I identified earlier with Deputy Mulvaney and Deputy Santiago, if you'd like to get with them, please get your question to them, and we promise you we'll make sure that we get the information out there to you. Thank you all again. Also, real quick, I'll get in trouble with the net members. I'm sorry. If you are not a member of the Sheriff's Net, and you would like to be, that's where we meet once a month, depending on your zone, but you'll have a meeting once a month. It's facilitated by the sheriff and a member of his command staff and the amazing members of the citizens of Clay County. So again, get with us on that because that's a good way to get a lot of information directly from the horse's mouth. And you can get that and take it back to your fellow neighbors and citizens. So thank you all, all again for coming. All right.